For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Dombrowski. Uh, greetings to everyone, the participants, the, the speakers, uh, my co-sponsors, Lara Car Car Cavallaro, who is uh, the Will College uh, administrative person who's taking care of me and keeping me on the right track. Um, I want a special thanks to Dan and Alex, who at the end of the semester managed to carve out the time uh, to do a talk. I will show this, oh, show the, well, it doesn't do very well without backwards, but their book, uh, Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of the American Global Order. I think they're gonna talk about some of their book and maybe address some of the uh, uh, issues that will be relevant for the uh, presidential transition. And frankly, whatever they wanna talk about uh, within the broad topic, because I think we'd all like to hear what they have to say. Um, before we begin, I just have a small bit of housekeeping. Um, this fall, I was awarded the Ruger Chair of National Security Economics at the Naval War College. Um, the Naval, uh, this was held by Ambassador John Cloud previously, and I will have this for the next uh, four or five years at a minimum. Um, there's many activities that this chair will engage with. Uh, lectures online, or hopefully at some point in person, uh, are only part of the drill. I think there'll be four or five in the particular series next year. And anybody that wants to get on a mailing list, let us know. And, and uh, I, can, uh, I can include you on the invitations. And of course, those of you that are joining us from the BU group and, and around uh, uh, can also let Rosella and Kaya know. Um, it is my great pleasure to co-host with Rosella and Kaya because they have provided a home away from home for me at BU in their political economy of security group, uh, allowed me to go up and join their seminars and present and talk with a lot of really interesting folks. So it's great to be finally able to reciprocate with a little bit on my own. Rosella, did you want to say something before I have one final uh, point? Yeah, so thanks uh, for all of you for joining us today. We have, um, for those not familiar, we have a workshop for people presenting, uh, workshopping anything, uh, policy papers through academic papers that look at the intersection of political economy and security. And we are interdisciplinary. We have mostly political scientists. We got historians and hopefully some more um, historians coming in as well. I'll send around an email soon to everyone. We have seven or six presentations coming up in the winter spring workshops if anyone wants to join. And if you wanna present with us, we would love to have you. Um, we love to encourage graduate students, particularly and those emerging scholars uh, to give them and amplify their work and their voices. So yeah, that's it. So happy to be here and looking forward to having this conversation. Okay, and this, the last thing I want to say is just a little bit about the approach today. I know most of you have done a million Zoom sessions over the last uh, nine months, but just to, to sort of summarize how we're going to do it here. Uh, so in, uh, Alex and Dan will talk uh, for 30 or 40 minutes. Um, there'll be 45 minutes, give or take a few left in the, for Q and A's from anybody in the audience. Um, I'll probably take the first question to get things rolling. And then uh, those of you who are out there in the audience, uh, please use the hand raising function and or uh, put a, just a summary or some kind of indication of what kind of question you're asking. And Kai is gonna sort of group questions and try to give us a little structure to the, the Q and A sessions. Um, roughly at uh, 1.30, uh, we will pack up because the Will College students have classes. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for taking the time out of your day. So over to Alex and Dan. All right, well, I'm gonna um, put up a, I'm gonna start the presentation. Uh, and as I do that, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. It's really not an imposition, you know, enough of us here are academics or academic adjacent to know that there's nothing that we like to do more than talk about our work uh, in front of a semi-captive audience, as it were. Uh, so uh, I, now, before I start, does this all look, uh, do you, don't, you don't see any weird floating windows, do you? Anything like that? Looks, you see a full screen? Okay. All right. So uh, thanks again for having us. Uh, the, uh, this is, this is, uh, the, you know, we are here to talk about um, Exit from Hegemony, and uh, this title is actually from a different presentation, but it fits what we're going to talk about anyway, which is that 
what the implications for the incoming Biden administration are. And essentially our bottom line is that uh, it will make a lot of difference in foreign policy, but it won't alter the fundamental drivers of geopolitical change. Um, note that our book cover uh, reflects when we wrote this book, uh, which was, uh, you know, which is uh, about, you know, over a year to two years ago, and it came out in April, and the press really thought that this was the way to go. So we got a picture of uh, Trump's rear side. Um, obviously, that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit um, itself is potentially exited, um, and we're hoping that when we do the paperback edition, which we will. Uh, have a lot more to say about um, you know about kind of post-Trump environment that maybe they'll maybe they'll add Biden to the mix, um, but obviously that's the kind of change that uh, now sort of structures some of our thinking and some of what we're going to say is the is the ele is the incoming uh, Biden presidency uh, and uh, the the kinds of arguments that are floating around about what it ought to be doing and how those intersect with the arguments we've been making. Uh, for the last few years. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with an over, and Alex will take over at certain points. I'm going to begin with an overview of the main argument. Uh, I like to put the, some of the punchlines out front. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about conceptualizing international order because some of the vocabulary we use uh, might be a little bit unfamiliar uh, because we sort of made it up in part. Um, uh, we'll talk about basic mechanisms of order contestation. Uh, we'll provide examples of the way that those mechanisms of order contestation have accelerated uh, and become more consequential for uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, system, as we sometimes call it, uh, the United States international system uh, and its uh, hegemonic system. Uh, and then we'll talk about some implications for the uh, Biden administration. Can you hear a bunch of noise in the background, by the way? Hey, Lyra, you can't have that on. You have to move. She's got her headphones on. Uh, I can just use my headphones. Okay, great. All right. So thanks. Terrific. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, all right. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, if you've been following like the, 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 the op-ed pages and the foreign policy and foreign affairs style outlets for the last you know, for a while, but even particularly in the last month or so, you've probably seen a lot of people making arguments about what a U.S. grand strategy should be in a post-Trump environment. There are a lot of options on the table, one of which is the restorationist position that says that, you know, fundamentally, there's nothing that about current trends that can't be reversed, uh, lays a lot of the blame for erosion of U.S. power and influence on Trump himself, uh, says this is more of a short-term thing that, uh, you know, the proper strategy can correct. Uh, and we just ought to go back to kind of doing what, we, what we've been doing, what we we're doing under the Obama administration, for example, and that will kind of solve all of the problems of U.S. leadership. Uh, we have a position that says um, that we, on the other side, that says that we should adopt a grand strategy of restraint, uh, that the whole pursuit of primacy or leadership as a sort of soft way of saying primacy, that's all wrong, uh, and it's dangerous for the United States, and, and that the lesson of the last four years is that we ought to uh, really kind of, I would say, retrench, but apparently that's not the right thing to say anymore. We ought to engage in restraint. Um, we have uh, people who say that, you know, essentially... It's not that we can restore, but we got to kind of keep the status quo ante where it is, kind of prevent further damage to the U.S. position, and that's the way things ought to be. Um, we have, of course, the great power conflict people, the GPCers, which range everywhere from, you know, we're in a world of new real politik and Trump punctured, punctured the illusions of liberal internationalism, all the way to we're in Cold War 2.0 and a full spectrum political conflict uh, with China and Russia usually. Um, we have the kind of reformers, uh, and these uh, range the gamut from kind of uh, center left to progressives to some conservative internationalists who say that, you know, we can't keep on doing things the way that things were being done, but we but we still ought to kind of um, uh, focus on a lot of the, the kinds of core goals and strengths of the United States, but we ought to reform institutions, reconstruct them, uh, create new institutions or new arrangements that might better suit the, the current period. Obviously, we always have the offshore balancers hanging out telling us that that's what we should be doing because that's always the case. Uh, and then there's the position we take, which doesn't really fit very well on a bumper sticker uh, that reflects a synthesis of some of the stuff, which is that we need to adjust to a more contentious international order. Uh, but this is not the same thing as the, the GPC wager, uh, as a, we've come to understand it, that we should reform where we can. 
uh, but not necessarily try to reform with the eye towards creating, making everything better. Uh, and that in general, we need to navigate a more competitive environment uh, when we think about uh, US security, foreign policy, and uh, national interests. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean uh, any of these kinds of uh, positions uh, as a kind of, uh, you know, that, that it's require a lot more pr pragmatism. So to get there, let's talk about the argument of the book. Um, our basic argument is the bottom line, US global hegemony is over with an emphasis on global. The United States can still and has can still, if it plays its cards right, be the most powerful country or at least lead the most powerful coalition of powers in the world uh, for some time to come. Uh, but that, that any kind of pretense to restoring to where things were in the 2000s, just forget about it. Um, that indeed the processes of hegemonic erosion are much further along than even some of the declinists think they are, uh, that um, we've been watch witnessing them for well over a decade now. Uh, and it's only that the, the sort of, a, the, it's only sort of that we've sort of retroactively become aware of them, uh, but they've really been going on for much longer. Um, that they are rooted in the good old thing that everybody who studies hegemony knows about, which are power transitions, uh, shifts in the relative distribution of power, shifts pr primarily in economic output uh, towards China and East Asia are, are driving a lot of these dynamics. Uh, but that in that Trump, uh, when we understand him properly, was an accelerant uh, and a symptom, but not a cause. Uh, we talk about three exits uh, because, you know, you got to have something like this, apparently, if you're going to do a quasi trade book. Um, so we have three exits. Uh, we have great power challenges. That's exit from above. Uh, we have uh, weaker state challenges. Those are from below. Uh, and we have counter order movements uh, that are challenges or exits from within uh, the core of the contemporary order. Um, one of our, our kind of takeaways too, although we're not going to emphasize that so much, I'm sure it'll come up in the Q&A, is that we think that you can have the implosion of hegemonic orders without any kind of great power war. And so while the debate over the Thucydides trap is interesting, uh, there's a way in which it probably distracts us from uh, how hegemonic orders collapse, which is usually before you even get to the war uh, in the first place. So let me talk a little bit about order contestation, and I'll start by talking a little bit about how we think about international order. Uh, so international order is one of those terms that you know gets bandied around a lot right now. They're really people don't usually tend to define it. Uh, when they do, they they fall back on this kind of rules, norms, and arrangement uh, uh, provision. But in our view, international order, properly understood, is just much larger than any single analytic. So you want to choose a kind of heuristic or an analytic that's going to help you kind of tell the story that you think is the, the right story to tell. And for us, that means separating international order into two facets, one of which is the what we call the architecture of international order. And that's what I just talked about, the rules and norms. It's, it's mostly what you hear about when you think hear about liberal order, you know, notions of economic openness, notions of, um, you know, norms of economic openness, norms of, of, of sovereign equality. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about contestation about international order in terms of things like uh, debates about the responsibility to protect uh, and whether or not that's a that's a that's an impermissible alteration in basic rules of international order or it's it's a consistent with kind of uh, commitments to liberalism. Uh, but our argument is that there's also an infrastructure uh, and that that infrastructure is a lot more important than uh, it usually gets uh, in terms of attention in most of the works about international order. And that infrastructure is composed of the networks the routine practices, the flows that are kind of the sinews of order, they undergird order, if you want to continue these metaphors, uh, in a hegemonic system, they are hegemonic infrastructure. Uh, and so for some of you, a lot of what we're talking about, the way you'll be most familiar with it are the kind of systems of joint exercises on the, on the security side, the way that the United States engages in all these routine military exercises, uh, interoperability uh, mechanisms, even though we never really get interoperability, um, routine you know, yearly bilaterals with certain countries, um, the multilateral uh, arrangements were embedded in officer rotations, uh, and, and particularly in also uh, uh, exchange of training arrangements. All those things in the security system are really fundamental components of that infrastructure. Uh, and there are also uh, parallels in the trade system, parallels in the, the, the sort of international cultural system, uh, diplomatic uh, 
uh, ties and diplomatic institutions, provide a lot of the infrastructure of contemporary international order, um, and that these are mutually implicating. And the fact that they're mutually implicating at a theoretical level, if you want to think about mutual constitution of agents and structures and layers of structure, that's the kind of thing we have in mind. On a more practical level, uh, what this means for us is that contestation over uh, one of the aspects can have implications for the other aspect, even when uh, the parties involved don't necessarily mean it. So you can get contestation over architecture that can affect or reconfigure infrastructure. Uh, and you get, can get contestation over infrastructure that can, or even contestation around infrastructure that isn't aimed at changing rules and norms, but does have that effect. Uh, and we'll, some of the examples we, we work through will be, uh, will be examples of precisely this happening. Uh, if you're on kind of the, the military security side, what this means is you can have uh, uh, changes in norms that affect the ability of the US to maintain its hegemonic infrastructure and thus can erode things we normally think about as hard power resources, uh, like uh, American uh, force projection capability through basing and access arrangements, for example. Uh, we use an ecology metaphor in the book. I don't want to go too far deep into that, but occasionally we'll use language that will smack of kind of uh, ecosystems and ecology. This is a mixing of metaphors, but it's how we sort of conceive of all of these put together. Okay, so logics of contestation. Uh, in our view, there are kind of two primary categories that actually almost all contestation combines in one way or another. Uh, the first of those, and those are really kind of two things. We, we borrow this from a lot of literature out there, um, also some other work that we've done independently, um, but uh, wedging and uh, brokerage. Uh, so wedging, that's the term that Tim Crawford uses in his work. Uh, often you see this as divide and rule, divide and conquer. Uh, brokerage is about the connection of ties. I'll, I'll walk through that in uh, more detail in a second. Uh, but there are some examples of the ways in which um, actors in order contestation uh, combine wedging and brokering that I just want to flag to kind of orient you. So one of those are what we will call order inoculation strategies. And these often involve wedging and brokerage at the civil society level designed to demobilize uh, Western NGOs and other kinds of uh, civil society transmission mechanisms uh, that uh, can push liberal rights or, or uh, democracy on states that don't necessarily want it. Um, we have uh, encouraging counter-order movements abroad. So, um, uh, you know, Russia has uh, for a long time in Europe uh, been supporting far right and far left groups. Uh, also been astroturfing, say, uh, green movements uh, to affect uh, some of these to demobilize certain policies like energy independence, others to actually try to undermine NATO cohesion or EU cohesion. This is a very kind of standard way of doing things in international politics that's been around for centuries. Um, we also have wooing strategic partners are a way that you can find these two things. Uh, you, we'll, we'll show you a bunch of that in practice at the different levels. Uh, but I want to go a little bit more now that hopefully that'll give you some sense of what we're talking about into the, actually the way these work in sort of graphical terms. So this is uh, supposed to represent, don't worry too much about, Keynote doesn't have a lot of countries in it. So I grabbed two continents in the United States to kind of represent the you know, white uh, red and green, uh, but you can think about these as sort of uh, as states or inter, you know international organizations or whatever. Uh, let's talk about them states. So the, the, you have ties between states, and these ties can take the form of alliances, dense diplomatic activity, uh, dense trade relationships, uh, the kinds of things that I mentioned as being uh, kind of crucial parts of, of the infrastructure of international orders. Um, and wedging is simply a a activity aimed to break that apart, right? To, to decrease the, 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 the strength of those ties, to decrease the density of those ties, and ultimately, um, in some cases, actually destroy or, or end those ties themselves. And there are multiple ways in which uh, actors can, can engage in wedging strategies or divide and roll, divide and conquer strategies. And they can, any, um, any kind of carrot, any kind of offer made to one side to try to get them to move away from the other side, wooing strategic partners, uh, any kind of threat, uh, uh, designed to try to um, break apart that relationship, a coercive threat made, for example, to a state saying if they maintain an alliance or relationship that they'll suffer uh, economic sanctions or military sanctions of various kinds. And then usually what you see in practice are combinations of carrots and sticks, uh, often targeted, in fact, at multiple uh, at multiple levels of analysis. And, you know, so, uh, you know, targeted at domestic interest groups and targeted at domestic parties and then targeted at uh, interstate relations and diplomats. Often all of these things are at play in wedging strategies. And it's important to note that 
these things can occur at any any kind of scale. Uh, they can be interstate, domestic, between international organizations, and we're seeing a lot of that going on. Uh, and one of the key arguments we make, actually, in the book, uh, is that power transition. These are kind of things that happen all the time. They're a normal part of the repertoire of power politics, but that power transitions really exacerbate them. Uh, and what power transitions do, in essence, is they give resources, they create uh, changes in the allocation of resources of states in the system. Uh, primarily, they give resources to rising powers who are not part of the coalition that has been maintaining order. And those no resources are resources that can be used for wedging strategies. They can be used as carrots, uh, and they can be used as sticks. Um, moreover, power transitions, uh, we all know this is like you know, 101 hegemonic stability theory uh, tend to produce revisionist sentiments, uh, and they do so in part because you get uh, powers that have more ability to shape international order, but didn't have as much of a say in how international order looked. And so they often want to make changes of various sorts. Uh, they also, on the flip side, can cause the incumbent powers to want to revise international order because, you know, this international order that they view as serving them really well is all of a sudden leading to powers, you know, new rising powers who they don't necessarily want to be rising. And so they themselves can see reasons to try to change uh, aspects of international order. At the domestic level, uh, oftentimes there are winners and losers. A lot of citizens, for example, in declining states feel that loss of their status and status anxiety associated with it. And they can then want to see changes in order. Maybe oftentimes they're, the people within the more powerful states might be losing uh, distributionally because of the same factors that are causing a rise and wealth elsewhere. You also have distributional effects in rising powers that can affect revisionist sentiments. Uh, and so that tends to increase, um, that, that tends to mean that power transitions both create kind of the means uh, and also the will among a lot of actors to try to try to engage in order contestation. And there are a bunch of things related to brokerage, which is I'm going to now turn. If wedging is breaking apart ties, then brokerage is the opposite. Brokerage is the creating creation of new ties, uh, the linking up of previously unconnected social sites. Uh, and this should this can be a little confusing because in, in the contentious politics literature, brokerage is the creation of new linkages, uh, but it also is a subject position or a, a network position that is being a broker. Uh, and if you know, if you've ever been in a situation in which you are in a brokerage relationship, you are the only person connecting to other people, or you are the go-between, for example, in a negotiation, uh, or uh, you are in a social circle where, you know, if you've ever been a social circle, like a mean girl style social circle, you know that the way that the center maintains power or the, the, the top dog, the top um, queen bee maintains power is by uh, keeping a uh, monopoly over those relationships and sort of being at the, in a brokerage position and playing off uh, the various uh, uh, players against one another. Uh, and, you know, so there are a variety of advantages that come from brokerage, most of which I've described, but it also gives you uh, asymmetric information because you have closer ties uh, with other actors. It also means that, you know, resources sometimes in some versions of these relationships have to flow through the broker. That can give them a lot of power. What, uh, what the contentious politics people call the ability to opportunity hoard, for example, but sometimes uh, brokers, uh, brokerage doesn't just involve the creation of these kinds of, uh, of, um, of uh, disconnected bilateral relationships. It also can involve closing triads or linking up the entire network. Uh, and I think what's important for us or just thinking about these kinds of dynamics is that this is what multilateralism is, right, versus kind of bilateralism or even the more imperial strategies. The difference between linking up uh, the sites that have been uh, initially brought into the hegemonic system uh, or in keeping them separate. This is the difference between, say, the U.S. alliance policy in East Asia uh, during the Cold War versus uh, the U.S. Uh, alliance policy in uh, Europe with NATO. Uh, now, what's interesting about power transitions is not only they provide more states with more resources to do this, but one of the effects of the rise of um, new potential new new powers with resources with the ability to essentially act as patrons is it can shift the, the power relations uh, towards uh, weaker parties right so if you're a, a country that had been a client of the United States 
And now you've got China and other powers around who can offer you some of the same uh, economic goods, development assistance or security goods or or status goods that the United States previously was the only player in town that could or the U.S. coalition, the U.S. and other Western donors could. That gives you the ability to act to, to be in a position of brokerage. Right. That gives you the ability to play off the two sides against one another to go to a different actor and to actually then put, be put in a, connect, a connecting position that would not have been possible beforehand. Uh, so power transitions create more possible patrons, which leads to more leverage for potential clients. And this leverage can be accomplished through exit. Uh, so, you know, if the United States is demanding certain things on the security, the human rights, the the economic openness side, the, the anti-corruption side that really as a ruling elite you don't want to go in for or as ideologically you're unhappy with, you can always leave the relationship, which is something that uh, if you did in the past, you didn't have you, you basically cut off a lot of your a lot of the international goods you used to receive. Uh, also, uh, a lot of states like portfolio diversification. They don't like to be dependent on anyone. So they just add donors or add security guarantees or add bases. Uh, and that gives them more autonomy in those relationships, even when they maintain those relationships. And then actively, you can leverage the threat of exit. This is what happened all the time in the Cold War. And there's a lot of evidence that things like human rights conditionality didn't matter very much, didn't have much effects during the Cold War because the United States was afraid to trigger it <laughs> lest it drove clients uh, out of the U.S. system or it empowered, it disempowered uh, authoritarian regimes and thus uh, made things easier for communist insurgents. Uh, but, it, but, but the same uh, evidence suggests that in the 90s, uh, when the United States had a monopoly of patronage in the unipolar system, uh, that conditionality started to actually have effects. And the reason was there were no exit options. So what does this mean in practice and how has this been shaking out in the present period? I'm going to turn over to, to Alex to talk a little bit about this, starting with uh, inoculation strategies, which, as I've said, involve uh, particular configurations of wedging and brokerage. So, Alex? Yeah, thanks very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thanks, Peter and Rosella, for the invitation. So let's go through some just empirical examples of this playing out in more contemporary ordering dynamics. Um, I think, you know, one of the most widespreading inoculation strategies has been uh, the current um, um, really tidal wave of restrictions and bans on the activities of international NGOs um, operating throughout the international system. Um, in the 1990s, uh, we had this literature on transnational networks. Um, we grew to believe that uh, activists were nimble, they could bounce around the sovereign in some ways that they were cleverer, and that they would eventually push universalizing liberal norms, uh, whether it's respect for human rights, gender equality, the environment, the campaign against landmines, um, and pressure even states uh, who didn't like to have their sovereignty usurped on this. Um, but in fact, and here Russia is leading the way, but it's not just Russia, according to some estimates, depending on how you count them, it's been more than 60 or more than 70 states since the year 2000 that have enacted NGO restrictions. This is perhaps one of the most dramatic, the uh, foreign agents law of 2012 uh, that required um, um, groups to self-designate as a foreign agent. And in 2014, um, we just had the outright criminalization um, by the undesirable organization law. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so I wanna briefly take uh, three of the pathways, the exit to show this mix of brokerage um, and wedging going on. Uh, uh, we look at great power order contestation, but we do it from the very specific uh, viewpoint of looking at ordering fabrics. Um, and what China and Russia are actually doing to alter the ecology of order. In other words, it's not a question of are they playing by the rules or not, right? That's not our focus. It's rather what kinds of institutions are they setting up? And here um, we're processing, uh, you know, a kind of a multi-level uh, 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 set of uh, features. So uh, the Belt and Road, as you probably had countless presentations, we view Belt and Road Dynamics as having both brokering and wedging dynamics. Um, wedging because certain countries in the Belt and Road have already started to go against um, traditional sort of foreign policy pathways. So take the example of Greece in 2017, vetoing the annual EU statement criticizing Chinese human rights uh, right after the Pyrus, uh, Piraeus uh, port deal is done. Um, but we also have increasing uh, uh, use of regional organizations by China and Russia in the book, 
um, we actually map out uh, and show that um, this wave of new kind of regional uh, uh, organizations in the security and the economic realm over the last uh, 15 years is creating this networking amongst them. Um, right, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, the CSTO, the Eurasian Economic Union. In other words, we're not so much concerned of whether they are effective or not, but rather how they are rewired um, uh, with each other. And we particularly identify Central Asia and Southeast Asia as having the greatest density of these uh, newer organizations. So we have the Belt and Road, we have new regional organizations that have very kind of different norms, very different agendas than traditional regionalism. But then we also have these dynamics boomeranging back into existing international organizations and for this is a map of a world map of the vote um, at the UN Human Rights uh, Council on the um, Xinjiang re-education camps. And in green are the countries that initially criticized China for the re-education camps. And these are the countries that belong traditionally, we think of as part of the liberal order, the US had withdrawn by then, but we have, we have Canada, we have Australia, we have Western Europe, we have the Scandinavian countries, we have Japan, we have New Zealand. And then a few weeks later, China mobilizes a counter letter of over 50 countries uh, in red that not only say the camps are totally fine, but that uh, laud China for its respect and support of the human rights system in general, right? And here you see you know, countries spanning uh, different sort of continents, um, a lot of them uh, 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 belt and road uh, clients, right? So we are you know, you know, redefining uh, uh, some of the instruments uh, and their purpose of the existing liberal international order. Let's go next slide. So that's from above. Equally interesting to us is from below. Weak states still don't get a lot of um, attention when it comes to sort of IR um, kind of order theorizing. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of what Dan was saying in practice, pop quiz, this gentleman on the left is Kurmanbek Bakiev. He was president of the Kyrgyz Republic in 2009, where he launched this audacious gambit in the presidential transition uh, of President Obama, where he uh, appeared with President Medvedev, and he said that the U.S. military base at Manas had become super unpopular. It was the, the main facility through which uh, uh, troops equipment was staged in and out of Afghanistan, and he was going to close the base down. And at the same press conference, President Medvedev announced that uh, Russia was providing the Kyrgyz uh, Republic with a $2 billion of investment and aid. Now, but Kiev, in kind of typical fashion, uh, waited for the first 300 million to come in from the Russians and turned around, did a new deal with uh, the US, upping the rent from 17 million to over 60 million and renaming it uh, a transit center, right? And so this is an example of leveraging patrons for what you want. But the phenomenon, and in this case, you can argue sort of, you know, Bakiev was unsuccessful. He was, uh, you know, his, his regime sort of collapsed a year later. But you see this phenomenon also with leaders in countries that have been part traditionally of the U.S. security system. Uh, Mr. Duterte, who has openly courted uh, Russia and China, who made it a point of canceling uh, the VFA on the, the grounds that one of his advisors was denied a visa on human rights grounds, banning U.S. senators, and then actually moved uh, to suspend the cancellation of the VFA. Um, this is part of, in this chapter, we call this growth in so-called multipolar populism, a group of looters, uh, Orban, um, Erdogan, who invoke the presence of China and Russia as alternative patrons as a sign of autonomy um, and domestic regime strength, right? That actually being locked into these traditional kind of Western liberal ordering mechanisms is itself a sign of sort of weakness. And in fact, we are uh, acting in the interest of the people because we actually have no problem um, partnering with Russia and China. Now, what's really interesting about this for us is that sometimes it's actually the perception that you have uh, multipolar alternatives as opposed to the reality that starts to drive local politics. This is a fascinating survey uh, undertaken by RFE uh, RL, uh, from uh, uh, this time last year. And uh, the title, as, as you see there, who gives the most aid to Serbia? So we, we, there was a polling of, of Serbs and 40% of them thought that China gives the most aid to Serbia, right? 40%. Uh, and almost 15% thought Russia gives the most aid to Serbia. 
Uh, only 18% thought the European Union, and by far, by far the most aid actually is given by the European Union, like 90%. And yet this perception lingered. Why? Because of the information space and environment, because of local populist politicians who play up the importance of uh, multipolarity um, and this perception that actually uh, Russia and China offer significant public goods when they don't actually do so. Next slide. Um, oh yeah, next prompt. And in our view, uh, the Ukraine conflict um, can be read as actually kind of a battle of two sets of uh, uh, ordering and public goods mechanisms, right? Sort of Yanukovych uh, 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 looking at the EU, then turning around, feeling pressure from Putin, getting sort of uh, more energy subsidies, more bond uh, uh, relief, and these sort of like two different zones of kind of ordering goods that Ukraine uh, uh, found itself in the middle, this sort of zone of contestation between the European Union Eastern Partnership Agreement um, and Russia that was pushing the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, let's go next. What do you do for you are voting, you are voting for the only current leader in the free world who has got the guts to stand up and fight for the nation state, to fight for patriotism, to fight against globalism. You'll be voting for the only leader in the Western world with the real courage to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party. Great. So then our final pathway is actually the internal one. Um, and the internal one within the so-called West, where we're seeing increasing transnational contestation of what ordering system, right, Western countries should be a part of. And we play the Farage clip because what is so fascinating about Trump, although he wasn't the cause, he has been an accelerant, specifically because the executive branch in the White House in, in particular is increasingly siding with illiberal Western movements as opposed to those that are seek to preserve the liberal order. You saw this in support for Brexit. You saw this in, 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 in UKIP, but you also see this in appointing ambassadors um, with this kind of uh, 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 right-wing populist affinity in places like the Netherlands, in Germany, in Hungary, that openly host and support um, internal um, right-wing movements. And in fact, in this latest Pew survey um, of sort of popularity in the world, well, you know, uh, U.S. was terribly unpopular. China wasn't that much more popular, actually. Terribly unpopular. What's interesting is that among European right-wing um, um, party supporters, Trump's popularity had skyrocketed over the last two years, right? So there is this kind of transnationalism uh, happening at the moment. Uh, next slide. And here we see Russia, because we talk a lot about Russia and its sort of role in here, both uh, wedging and brokering. Wedging in the sense that they are actively supporting uh, Liga Norte uh, uh, politicians uh, like Mr. Salvini or the AFD or uh, Marine Le Pen um, in Europe. And it actually doesn't take a lot of money to do that. Um, so this is kind of an attempt to sort of, you know, uh, 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 splinter these parties from the commitment to the transatlantic system. But we see some brokering too. This is Mr. Orban, Prime Minister Orban, delivering the keynote at the World Congress of Families. Now the World Congress of Families is an interesting, it's almost like the, the kind of antithesis of some of these liberal activist networks. It was founded by two Christian right movements in the 1990s. Then it has become funded by Eurasian and oligarch capital and has had recent meetings in Moscow, in Budapest, um, in Verona uh, most recently. Um, and the agenda there is very much uh, so-called pro-family, anti-LGBTQ, um, uh, focus on sort of reproductive rights, anti-immigration, um, and um, this sort of joint mutual affinity against liberalism. Um, next one. Just ignore this because then it's the new slide. Yep. So uh, I just just very briefly. So counter order. The, our focus in counter order movements is something that that is really I think fairly distinctive about our argument. Um, and sometimes we get kind of people wondering, well, why does this matter, right? And they're sort of at a meta level, um, it seems sort of odd that we would say that contestation over liberal norms, you know, with a particular political valence uh, can affect U.S. hegemony. But I think as you've probably understood by now, part of our argument is that 
a lot of the sort of mechanisms of liberal normative ordering are actually uh, mechanisms of U.S. hegemony and U.S. power. And so to uh, start to erode those or reverse those has implications for U.S. influence globally. It tends to redistribute influence away from the United States. Uh, but there are some other reasons why we should really care about counter-order movements. All of the traditional uh, or almost all of the traditional like textbook revisionist states uh, of hegemonic stability theory are were, didn't become revisionist states sort of through some thing that absent domestic politics or through a change of heart of a leader. They originated from subnational and transnational political movements like fascism, which was not just a national movement. It was a transnational uh, collection of sometimes contentious, but often uh, mutually supportive and brokering uh, far right movements that was global in character, in fact, in the in the 20s, um, and which then came to power in states and, and came to power already uh, with uh, huge grievances against international order and then drove revisionist foreign policies. Similarly, in my own uh, past work, um, you can find uh, that some examples Examples of the, one of the archetypal examples that's supposed to be strategic overextension in the hegemonic cycle is in fact a case of transnational political contention causing overextension and causing uh, hegemonic decline, and that is transnational religious contention uh, in the 16th and 17th century, which is what got the Spanish bogged down uh, in the Netherlands, which I think is really crucial to understanding uh, why Spain uh, precipitously declined over the next over those two centuries, it went from a period of being a, a bid for hegemonic domination uh, to one of a much, much weaker position. And then finally, one of the most consequential changes in international order the last 100 years, uh, the shift against formal empires and decolonization, a lot of that story is the story Story about transnational uh, anti-imperial agitation, both the transnational spread of ideas and transnationalization of decolonization struggles, which brought about, you know, a huge, you know, was pretty important in helping to bring about a big shift uh, in international ordering, one that, that greatly eroded, um, uh, you know, sort of actually two of American allies. So we want to just conclude with uh, briefly running through some implications, uh, you know, basically, you um, I'll talk about the first ones. Our view is that Biden's election does have uh, implications for US global prospects, depending on how you think about it, what side you're on for good or for ill. We think it matters that the White House is no longer aiding and abetting counter order movements. Uh, we think it's going to matter that Biden has more interesting goods provision uh, than, than the Trump administration overall did, although the Trump administration did get in the game in some places, uh, and that uh, the Biden administration will certainly pay more attention to trying to maintain political liberalism within incumbent institutions of the international order. Uh, but that doesn't change any of the underlying pressures or the overall operation of mechanisms. And as um, Alex will mention right now, uh, there are ways in which even the sort of uh, some of the kind of the kind of uh, reordering or reformism that, that Biden has in, in his national security team has signaled a very strong interest in it will, will be itself very contentious. Uh, and Alex, do you want to talk about this for a second? Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're over time, but I think, you know, let's just take the example of one of the big bets in terms of sort of the norms and values, the sort of Biden teams as sort of espoused by Jake Sullivan in that Politico interview, uh, the anti-corruption agenda, right? That's going to sort of, you know, come in strong and hard. We've seen Magnitsky adopted, um, you know, over in Europe, we see this sort of comprehensive set of anti-corruption members. Well, now play this out. If you start launching these anti-corruption uh, campaigns sort of extraterritorially, one of the leaders of these, these states, um, you actually create opportunities here for sort of backlash um, for, you know, Russia and China uh, to take the side for the overall politicization uh, or geopoliticization and the sort of selective use of this enormously uh, powerful extraterritorial anti-corruption tool like the FCPA. Um, and so uh, 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 I think that, you know, the main issue that the Biden in administration has to contend with is traditionally ambassadors um, and presidents overseas, especially within our allies, you know, we tried, even though we had favorites and favored political parties, we tried not to put our thumb in the scales. And yet it might be unavoidable now that given this new contentious environment that members of uh, an administration that seeks to preserve or expand the liberal order uh, is going to have to explicitly support uh, factions, parties, individuals, and coalitions within these groups of traditional allies that um, uh, seek to uphold the same. And then that takes us in a very different world than we were before. 
right? Because it institutionalizes this type of uh, uh, systemic cooperation, non-cooperation at the transnational, at the domestic level. And then our final recommendation here is U.S. is just going to have to learn to lose. You can't outbid China all the time, right? You can't um, go to every sort of place and try and deny an access to a facility um, or to a regulatory standard or the adoption of a technology. And so part of this is going to have to be, um, you know, some countries that play with China are going to have to learn about China's own kind of credibility and the way that they insert themselves into domestic politics. And, and that's okay. Letting others lose on their own, I think, rather than getting completely obsessed with kind of this kind of a global uh, com uh, competition and sort of denial of ordering space for us um, is a much more kind of prudent way to go. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Gentlemen, um, what I'm going to do is take the moderator's prerogative and ask a single question. And then uh, folks that want to ask questions or have issues raised, if you can raise your hand in the participant list and also maybe give a brief uh, summary of what your or a brief question in the chat function so we can sort of gather them. We have about a half hour left uh, and that will be wonderful. So what I want to ask about um, <clears throat> I love that you said, you know, we don't have to have a great power war. And I like that you use the term contestation. But in your conclusion, and in the world I live in, which is the Naval War College, you know, the question is great power competition. And I, I have such a problem with great power competition in the following way. What are we competing for? How do we keep score? I mean, the American uh, sort of sports analogy doesn't work very well. There's no time frame. There's no, you know, point system. Uh, you know, when do we know when we are out competing the Chinese or the Russians? And then how does the ordering function play into that? Because in some ways, the ordering function, as you allude to in a bunch of ways in your, in your book, is about, you know, allocation of cost, burden sharing, sharing of, and, and, and the idea that the hegemon itself, at least in kind of classic hegemonic theory, provides certain goods, even though it bears a disproportionate share of the cost. So what about this idea of competition? And is that something that's even useful for IR and policy specialists to think about? Thank you. I mean, uh, I'll let Alex handle the second half, but on the question of great power competition, I think that the what it does make sense in the context of U.S. force structure to think about whether our key war fighting needs have to do with deterring great powers versus, say, engaging in uh, various quote, quote unquote low intensity conflicts. But I think more broadly, the, the GPC approach um, has a whole bunch of problems, and one of which is, is to begin with, right, that the question is, what are you competing over? Competition is not an end in itself although uh, the U.S. has a tendency to make it one, which is uh, an interesting route to overextension and a fairly common one. Uh, and also uh, the idea that, that it, if you're in a more competitive world, the only uh, tool available is to compete. In fact, uh, one of the ways to deal with a more competitive world is to cooperate more, right? Um, you don't have to necessarily uh, treat every, uh, every instance of, uh, of contention and competition as an opportunity to have to, uh, you know, you, you can diffuse things. You can think about security dilemmas driving some relationships and that that competition is not the right answer for that. Um, so to me, the GPC paradigm, is, and I have, I have a piece hanging out right now awaiting uh, editorial comments somewhere on this, but I, I think that it, it it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, the whole idea that, that there's some kind of model out there, this world that we enter called great power competition, and then there are useful time periods that provide lessons for how we deal with that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, great power competition is both something that always happens, <laughs> right? It's there even during periods of U.S. hegemony, uh, and that um, it is something that is not necessarily simply foisted on us by the structure of international politics or by the disposition simply of others, right? Uh, which is what a lot of these uh, approaches, to, you know, sort of deny the U.S. any kind of agency. 